Is this thing recording? Okay, we're good. Hi everyone, my name is Gaurav. I'm a third year physics student at UCL and I'm joined here today with Alex. Hi, I'm uh, Alex. Uh, I am a, well, formerly third year theoretical physics student, now, a four, now going into fourth year um, at UCL as well. So we're a part of the Phys Filmmakers here at the UCL Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, we seek to promote physics to non-graduates, aspiring physics students, and members of the general public. I think that there is mostly a mix of interest and fear in physics for the general public, kind of like maths. Physics is extremely interesting, but frustrating at the same time, since there are so many unanswered questions. But people may feel intimidated by all the maths and complexity that comes with understanding physics. I know I do. Uh, when you're watching a TV programme, for example, and a hard question is asked to a physicist, most of them say, oh, this is too hard to explain to someone who hasn't done a physics degree. And I think that's quite frustrating, being told it's too complicated. And I feel that's not totally true. It's sort of our job to make sure physics is accessible to everyone who has an interest. And that's our motivation for bringing you this podcast. We aim to bring you the interesting parts of physics that typically even aren't una accessible to physics students until they have done a PhD, for example. You don't really need to know the maths to appreciate the beauty of the underlying physics behind many topics and areas um, of serious debate amongst the science community. So we bring you Debatable Physics. So for our first topic, I wanted to talk about the idea of living in a simulation. Um, this concept actually has a name, um, it's simulation hypothesis, and I definitely did not look that up on Wikipedia because that would be disgraceful to the world of science. No, um, but I should point out a disclaimer that we are in no position whatsoever to teach about the idea of a simulation. Um, you're going to have to get an acclaimed professor. Um, but what we're trying to do is have a sort of a discussion about this idea, our own personal opinions and thoughts. So if we do say something that's not right, please forgive us um, and take everything we say with a grain of salt. Um, now, have you come across this idea before, Alex? Yeah, I have. Um, I think I was watching a documentary of some sort. It might have been one of those um, what, 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 I don't know, but the ones, I don't know if you know the ones that Morgan Freeman narrated. I think it was called Through the Wormhole. Through, yes, yes, Through the Wormhole, that's the one. I mean, this idea first came to my light, and certainly I would say the public light, when Elon Musk revealed he believes in the idea that we could be living in a simulation. Now, when I first heard this, I thought to myself, well, he does say some pretty controversial stuff. Now, going off of 32 most outlandish things that Elon Musk has ever said, thank you internet, he believes that there are aliens, he wants to colonise Mars, as with his company SpaceX, and plenty of other stuff. He does say a lot of weird things, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> but I want to focus on his idea of living in a simulation. I have this clip here of him briefly explaining his thought process. The, 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 I mean... I think here's, in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for, the, for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. And soon we'll have virtu you know, vir virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. Just in indistinguishable. Um, e even if that rate of advancement drops by 
a thousand from what it is right now. Um, then you just say, okay, well, well let's imagine it's a 10,000 years in the future, uh, which is nothing in the evolutionary scale. Um, so, um, so, so given that we're clearly on a trajectory to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, and those games could be played on any set-top box or on a PC or whatever, and there would probably be you know, billions of such uh, you know, computers or set-top boxes, it would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. Um, I'm not sure where the probability comes from, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure where the probability comes from because that just seems sort of just plucked out of thin air almost. But it's sort of like, yeah, I don't know where he gets those numbers from either. I'm assuming he's talking about order of magnitudes mainly. I think what he says is plausible. Surely, if these video games that are currently being developed become more and more ultra realistic, then we could be living in a video game, I suppose. I should point out the history of this topic first of all. Um, the mastermind of this concept, um, I suppose, is Nick Bostrom. Um, he's the first name that will come up if you Google simulation hypothesis on the internet. Um, he's a philosopher at Oxford, and he's come up with many ideas surrounding the future of humans and AI, etc. So much so that he's created the Future of Humanity Institute, which aims to um, ensure that the future generations of humanity can sort of continue on, which I think is amazing. But he wrote about the simulation, simulation hypothesis in a paper back in 2003, which is not that long ago, but is really old in technology years. He states that there are three possibilities for the future of humans regarding simulation. Uh, simulate, simulation. All human-like civilizations in the universe go extinct before they develop the technological capacity to create simulated realities. So that may be through nuclear destruction or climate change or an asteroid impact like the dinosaurs. Um, the second one is, if any civilizations do reach this phase of technological maturity, none of them will bother to run simulations. So ethically speaking, Humans will, I guess, refuse to run simulations, even if we have the technology to do so, maybe through some fear of what we'll discover or the consequences. And the third and last point is advanced civilizations would have the ability to create many, many simula simulations. And that means there are far more simulated worlds than non-simulated worlds. So attributing to our nature, if we have the ability to create a simulation, we probably will and we'll probably do lots and lots of them. Given that there are maybe other life forms out there who may have beat us to it, we may be one of those actually living inside one of their simulations, which I know sounds absurd, but plausible nonetheless. So in terms of this hypothesis, I presume, does that mean, obviously, of course, when you say simulated reality, there are, one can interpret that a number of ways. So like, of course, we could, we could potentially simulate reality right now, but obviously it probably wouldn't be a very um, good simulation. So I presume you mean first of all that um, it's a like accurate, almost reflection of our universe, li literally almost a copy. But perhaps if we wanted, is that what you're sort of saying when you say si when you mean simulated reality? Because there are sort of levels to um, how accurate the reality being simulated is. So, if we were going to simulate our own reality, I'd assume it's a simulation of our entire universe, almost a carbon copy. If you've heard the idea of the Turing test, then I'd imagine our simulated universe would have to be indistinguishable from our actual universe. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Turing test is essentially the idea that in order for a computer, or in this case a simulation, to pass the test, a human would not be able to tell the difference between a computer and another human when they're sat in front of both. So in our case, there'll be a sort of blurred line between reality and simulated reality. Mm. It's, I mean, the thing I, the thing that for me is quite a sort of leap is sort of this sort of timeline of, oh, they're not like, they'll not be able to simulate 
um, the universe. Um, so the sort of assumption that you won't reach the computing power, it's hard to say because obviously as computing power increases, I mean, if the leap, if the leaps we make in computing power help to make even more leaps and sort of help speed it up even more and more and more, um, it's difficult to say sort of where we'll be um, in in the future. So it's sort of to put a sort of fine cap on it to say we'll never be able to reach that. I feel is a bit of an uh, it might be a bit of a bold assumption. Additionally, I think. The idea that um, a civilization wouldn't um, run um, r wouldn't wouldn't what wouldn't run the simulations is also another um, thing I would disagree with because I, d I I mean it just it just depends like, I think because obviously I mean hu humanity has done a lot I mean I mean it might not even be, simulating reality might not even be a bad thing in and of itself. So, um, I mean, sometimes you might just want to sort of see what's going to happen in the future. Again, that's sort of more a sort of question of, well, there are ethics and um, just to say that, that, that it's, to say that um, a civilization won't do it again is I think an, an assumption perhaps too far because you can't really predict what how a civilization will necessarily behave necessarily, particularly um, this far off in the future. I agree with that idea totally. I mean, humanity has a great sense of curiosity um, and it's never stopped us in our long history. Uh, for example, um, when the Egyptians buried their pharaohs in the tombs, they were never to be opened to respect their kings and queens. Uh, little did they know that modern day humans would go excavating the Valley of Kings, totally going against um, the Egyptians' wish. Um, I mean, our curiosity may even one day cause our extinction. Uh, going off on another topic, uh, with regards to nuclear waste, um, well, we've got to put it somewhere and make sure that future humans or other species should they find a whole bunch of nuclear waste, not to disturb it. Uh, otherwise, we know what's going to happen. So we have to make sure to hide it and not let our curiosity get in the way of discovering what it is. So if we do have the capacity to create simulations, I think it would take a lot of willpower to not go through with the simulations itself. Now, the consequences of doing so are so far unknown, and I guess will be unknown until we do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and given a humanity's history, it is a, a very dubious, um, dubious point. Now, our current technology at hand, as well as speculation of the impact of future technologies impacting the way humans interact with stuff like artificial intelligence, is really well documented in this book called Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark. I really recommend it if you're looking to read about this a bit more. Um, Techmark is a professor of physics at MIT. Um, and in one of the chapters early on, he posed this sort of three different types of questions with regards to how much computing power is needed to provide a simulation, which is a very abstract concept in itself. I mean, what are we simulating? The brain, the human intelligence, or the universe? Um, and so he asks for the first question, how many floating point operations per second or flops are needed to simulate the human brain? Um, the second one is how many flops are needed for human intelligence and how many flops can a human brain perform? I was just going to say, I think this sort of idea that um, just merely, merely repeating the same number of calculations as the human brain um, is enough to qualify as sort of reproducing the human brain is a bit misleading. I think there's a bit more to um, the the brain that, than, than, actually than that, of course, than just the operations. Um, so for instance, I was at the artificial and I was at the AI conference for the Data Science Society uh, earlier this year. I think one of the one of the one of the panelists can't recall their name said that 
we don't really have AI per se I mean, in, in the sense that all of the AI generally that we have generally function for a specific purpose. Whereas the human brain is rather broad in what it in, in its scope and uh, what it does, um, so what we what we really want it might be called general artificial intelligence, so to speak. So something more like a, something more like a, something something that just obviously, as I say in the examples that I brought up, you have the the, the machine learning algorithms that can sort of pick a pick at the um, pick a, pick out a signal and say, oh, that's the Higgs boson there in, in CERN. But it can't really do more than that. I mean, if you, if you had something, if you had that algorithm and you said, okay, it had this, this computer can do this calculation with, to the same number of operations as a human brain, that's not really the human brain, is it? Because it's, it's only doing one thing, whereas the human brain does so many things, if that makes sense. Absolutely. You've sort of answered these questions already. So just to give you a couple of numbers so that you can comprehend the answers to these questions, it's estimated that around 10 to the 17 or 100,000 million million flops are needed to simulate the brain. Now, there's already a supercomputer out there called Sunway Tahalite that was built in 2016 at a cost of $300 million that can simulate the human brain. Um, but the human brain actually only performs around 0.01 flops, which is the answer to the third question. Uh, this is a staggering difference, and as you said, Alex, these differences are attributed to the fact that there's a discrepancy between humans and supercomputers being optimised for extremely different tasks. So, we pose the question, well, what kind of simulation are we looking to do? Do we want to simulate the human brain? If so, we can already do that, but at a very high cost. Do we want to simulate the universe? Which means, at the very least, we have to simulate around 7 billion human brains. Or do we simulate our own perception of the universe? We may not need to simulate the whole universe if we can't access the whole universe from our home, Earth. In actual fact, it'll be extremely difficult. I think, to simulate the whole universe since there are so many grey areas, like what came before the Big Bang, what lies inside a black hole, etc. But ignoring the idea of simulating all matter and processes in the universe, maybe it's okay to universe, uh, maybe it's okay to simulate the universe from how we perceive it to be. Um, for example, if you pick up an apple, um, then really only what we perceived to be the apple needs to be simulated, um, the outside of it, um, the core of the apple would be completely empty until we take a bite out of the apple, um, to which then the core of the apple is simulated slash loaded in for us to perceive, um, which is another strange idea. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're running a simulation like that, that would, that would make sense to sort of save the, the processing power like that. But I think I get, this sort of goes to sort of the idea of if we were in a simulation, sort of, which, who, do we define ourselves as uniquely the observer, um, for instance? So for instance, is the, is, is, uh, is the simulation based solely around our perceptions of reality? Or, um, what about, what about, what about other, other, other species, other animals, for instance, um, would our perception is our perception so so unique that uh, um, that the simulation only revolves around us? I think again, it might be a sort of precautionary sort of tale to sort of assume that uh, humanity has this unique place in the universe. I mean, if we live in a simulation, then everything we see may be simulated from our perspective, the human perspective. Um, all animals or other galaxies are just a product of simulation. We as life who have consciousness just perceive it to be that way, I guess. I mean, I don't exactly know how our consciousness would play into this all, or even if we're not the only life forms out there with consciousness. Hmm. Yeah, for instance. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any particular reason why 
why animals wouldn't say have a have a consciousness as well as us. So, um, again, sort of saying that the simulation would revolve around us is a bit precarious, perhaps. Um, it depends. I, again, how do you define an observer, for instance? Do you, do you even do you even go for say any life like plant life? I mean they well they have they perceive in their own way I guess obviously they're not very different um, but they they can sort of certainly react to the world around them um, given certain stimuli of course so um, is is the, the reality projected for plants as well for instance. Hmm. It's an interesting conundrum and sort of brings in philosophy and biology into this argument. Um, but the reality is, I think we just don't know. I mean, there are so many types of simulations that we could be living in. I mean, if we are living in one, what would be the sort of details of it? For example, could our consciousness be controlled by other life forms living outside the simulation, like a sort of video game style sims, in which case we don't actually have any freedom or consciousness. Um, it's all being controlled. Or was our simulation set up at the Big Bang and then sort of left us to it, like a black box? Only for like the external observers to see what happens to the universe through time, sort of like a natural observation? Well, it's a, it's a very difficult question, of course, because once you want to, you, I mean, there could be any of those things if if that were if that were the case. Uh, once you, um, yeah, once I mean again, it sort of just depends upon the the sort of uh, motivations of what whatever's behind this, uh, whatever's creating this running si the simulation. But without no without knowing that a priori what it's like it's very difficult to sort of actually sort of gauge for that and what it's and what the ramifications of that might be i mean i mean if it could be that they sort of intervene in some way i don't know if that's a possibility um but th so far i might but so far things look like they're very um i mean certainly from the perspective of humanity at least um, for the short time frame that we've been here relative to the scale of the age of the universe certainly from our perspective it's been a very uh, shall we say uncontrolled um, and events seem to have from our from what we can do from our to the best of our knowledge they just proceed um, without any sort of external force controlling them but um whether that changes in the future, I mean, I guess that opens that possibility up. Um, or it could be that these things have just been subtly manipulated. Um, but again, it's it's all very speculative. <laughs> it's all just sort of, what could this uh, be? What could that be? It's It's hard to say. I also wanted to dwell on the idea of the multiverse theory. Um, so as it goes, this idea is that every time a decision is made in the universe, it could be, for example, someone deciding to wear a red t-shirt or a blue t-shirt today, um, the universe will split into two versions, one where the person wore the red t-shirt and one where they wore the blue t-shirt. And this sort of implies to me personally that there are an infinite number of, number of decisions that could be made today. In an essence, we could strip all decisions made in the universe down to the rearrangement of atoms. And there is or will be a universe for every rearrangement of atoms in the entirety of the universe. Um, so that would imply to me that there would have to be an infinite amount of matter then. And just like the idea of an infinite amount of energy, this sort of sounds impossible to me. So maybe it could be that if we were to live inside a simulation, then this would be no problem at all, since there's no actual matter, everything is simulated, and given that a simulation can be run, then many, many more simulations can be run at the same time. 
uh, going back to the third point of Bostrom's argument. And so there is a simulation for every possible outcome for our universe down to every decision made by every human. Um, again, this would just be my opinion. That's interesting because, um, of course, yeah, I, 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 I would, I would have said obviously decision making being a deciding factor again is sort of like a there shouldn't really necessarily be the unique decider as to the splitting, but this sort of multiverse idea, sort of, you know, it, I mean, because obviously you're, what you're saying is that if there's loads of universes, there's loads of matter, right? Is that essentially what you're sort of implying? Uh, yes. The question also, the question from that, I suppose, is what, uh, if, how do those other universes interact with each other? Um, is it possible to interact with another universe? And I guess that's a very difficult question. I mean, first of all, we need to sort of gauge whether these un other universes would exist before we can, they need to be there to, to, for us to interact with. Um, second of all, yeah, and if they are there, what, how, do we, how do we even interact? Um, there's a lot there to unpack. I'm not sh sure how to go about this. I mean, it's it's a it's possible. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how reliable this sort of uh, many worlds theory is, but um, obviously it's it's something that would be incredibly difficult to obtain evidence for. Um, but it's an interest. It's an interesting idea, nonetheless. Uh, just sort of the, but just sort of trying to figure out how to sort of um, gauge what 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 uh, those other universes might be like, and how, if at all, we could interact with them. For instance, would we need to go to the edge of our universe? Well, that's impossible because <laughs> you need to travel faster than the speed of light. So that's uh, sort of. Um, not really, not really um, helpful there. Um, but yeah, it's also it's interesting. Or is there, or are there other ways of going to these universes? Uh, who knows? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Um, my mind's a bit blown right now. Uh, I just don't know. I don't know what to think to be honest. But I guess if we don't know things about our own universe, then these human-run simulations can help us to uncover more about our own universe. Maybe we might uncover things we might not have uncovered about our own universe had we not run simulations, um, because our limitation to create technology that's that lets us explore the universe from another perception, um, for example, exploring physics in multiple dimensions. Well, I mean, in the context of understanding our universe i mean i suppose we'd have to probably it, it depends first of all on how much by that point how much do we know about our universe do have we uncovered all the big uh unanswered questions um i mean it's unlikely that we're, we would have answered every phys major physics question by that point but if we haven't then obviously that's a sort of pathway to answering those potent answering some of those potentially um, I mean, if it is a exact replica of our universe, um, then it gives us almost a sort of, uh, crystal ball into what might happen in the future, which is a potentially dangerous thing, I guess, but, uh, yeah, um, there's also, I guess, the possibilities of sort of almost letting people live out, I don't know, depending on how this sort of, uh, this sort of simulation is sort of designed, sort of letting people sort of almost play out the, play out a sort of alternate reality, um, potentially where they sort of live in a completely different universe and sort of, but yeah, just different. So it might be, it might be interesting. Um, but again, it's a long way off into the future. But it's all exciting stuff if we actually if we actually get to the point where we could do it then that would be 
it would certainly serve us incredibly well and perhaps in understanding um, more about our universe at the very least. I guess I guess if you if you could simulate perhaps those sorts of uh, regions of physics that we can't sort of probe experimentally, for instance, Maybe even string theory. I, I mean, string theory is a thing that uh, has eleven. That supposedly ha has to work in eleven dimensions, but works quite well at generating the forces like gravity and uh, the four the four fundamental forces of nature. Obviously, just the caveat with a caveat of needing so many dimensions. Um, of, but being of scales that are too small for us to sort of look at experimentally at least now and probably in the foreseeable future. Um, I suppose the simulations, if you can if you can sort of simulate those sorts of things and that would make those things a lot quite a considerable deal easier to test in a sense that would give us a whole laboratory that uh, um, with almost unlimited potential I suppose. Um, so, for instance, high energy physicists, if, if this was a very accurate representation, then you could have high energy physicists um, who, instead of building new colliders, literally just sort of build a virtual collider and sort of just um, <laughs> put it to whatever energy they want and they test out all these um, new theories beyond standard model theories, I guess. Now, a really important question is that, how do we prove that we live in a simulation, if we do live in one? Um, there are a couple of papers out there that set out how to prove this, potentially, in theoretical terms, obviously. Um, one of the papers that seems to stand out to me um, is called On Testing the Simulation Theory, um, and it was written by Campbell et al. in 2017. Uh, their main assumption is that such a simulation would have flaws and bugs that would allow us to exploit and find out whether or not we live in a simulation. Um, they state that the simulation performing, um, they state that the computer performing the simulation um, is finite, uh, i.e. it has limited resources, um, and hence such a system would, as in a video game, render content reality only at the moment that information becomes available for observation by a player and not at the moment of detection by a machine. So I believe this links to my example of simulating an apple. So for example, in our world, if we're running a video game on a laptop with poor technical specifications, then to us, the whole game would lag awfully. The idea would be that a character in the game, if it has a consciousness, would notice this lag and think, oh, I must therefore be in a simulation, otherwise there'd be no lag in a simulation. Of course, if the video game was running on a high-end computer, it would be very difficult to see this effect. It is, it is a tricky one. I mean, this sort of idea of being... I mean, if you're limited in the simulation, I mean, your, you, you, your, the example you put there is an interesting one. You say, you say with, the, with a poor laptop, you, you'll be able to clearly see it's a simulation. This is, from, this is from your external point of view, though. This is like from the outside, you can see the lag and notice it. If you're an observer inside, you are limited by how fast this simulation runs. So almost in the sense of your measurements should in, sense, in a sense also be limited and restricted by how fast the simulation runs as well. So I, I'm sort of a, of a mind that it would be quite uh, tricky to actually probe um, um, and sort of gain a sense for it. Um, as to how you would go about this, you'd have to be remarkably clever. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, I'm not too sure, but I don't know if that sort of an analysis makes sense um, from my perspective, from what I've just said. I get what you mean. I'm assuming that the characters in the video game have some sort of capacity to see that they are in a simulation, given that there are features that we see to let us know that a video game is a simulation, apart from the obvious, um, like the lag. But assumptions aside, interestingly, they want to explore Young's double slit experiment. Um, and I wonder why it may be, given that it is done to death um, by everyone who's done a physics degree, and they're probably sick of hearing about it. 
but it is a really important experiment as it helped us ponder on the idea of wave particle duality. Um, would you mind explaining wave particle duality, please, Alex? Uh, well, wave particle duality is the idea that um, what you have you you have um, particles on the quantum level um, behaving rather much like waves. Um, instead, they sort of travel as this. Um, shall we say, a cloud, well, a wave-like packet of probability, where the wave sort of um, uh, is more a measure of the probability of finding the particle in a particular place. Um, I don't know if that's a reasonable way of putting it. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, or until, until you actually like measure it, it is this wave function and once you measure it, this wave function collapses, is the, um, is the idea of quantum mechanics. So, from what I can interpret from the paper, bearing in mind, I could be completely wrong, so please forgive me if I have massively misunderstood the concepts in this paper. Um, I'm going to try my best. But for those of you that don't know about Young's double slit experiment, um, it's basically, you have a beam of light, that is being fired at two parallel slits um, and that light is then being projected onto a screen. Now, if a light behaves as a particle, which was what was believed when they first did the experiment, you would see two spots on the screen directly in front of the two slits where the particles of light shine through the slits. It's common sense, but actually, what actually happened was not only were the two spots in front of the slits, but multiple spots of light that weren't even in front of the slits in what is called an interference pattern. Um, now that is only a phenomenon um, if light was a wave, but if you then and detect and record at the slits, um, the slits where the particles pass through, then an interference pattern isn't observed and only two spots, as, as what we would have thought if light was um, a particle. So in this way, um, detecting and recording the light has an effect of whether it behaves as a particle or a wave um, in wave particle duality as explained by Alex. So traditionally this detecting and recording regarding which way um, the particle goes through which slit, um, it's done at the slits, but it leaves us to ponder whether the detection machine we use might have caused this particle-like behaviour so there's this idea that this which way detections can be performed after the particle has gone through the slit. Um, and actually it makes no difference whatsoever um, whether the which way data is recorded before, at or after the slits. Um, therefore the results we see at the screen is a result of recording the data, wave particle duality. So they sort of play on this idea and have thoughts on what would happen if you erase um, this sort of which way data. And for me, this is where things get a bit hazy, um, but, be, but feel free to have a read of the paper yourself. Um, they basically summarise that the pattern found on the screen is, computing, is computed and available to be re rendered to an external observer only at the moment the information becomes avail available for observation and not at the moment of detection by a machine. Well, I'm... It, it, it sort of depends, because I think in the act of measuring, you sort of interfere with the system itself. You sort of um, almost spoil this, this sort of system, and that sort of that might be why you get this sort of collapse of the wave function. So, uh, yeah, it's... Do, I mean, the, the, the very sort of probabilistic uh, nature of sort of making predictions about um, where the particle will be is obviously makes things a bit difficult in quantum mechanics, so it's a, it's, it's a tricky sort of uh, idea to sort of get your head around whether you should sort of, whether this is a, sort of an indication of uh, this of being a, a sort of a way to um, perhaps probe what, um, if, if we are in a simulation or not, I'm not entirely certain. Again, I sort of think the limitations of 
the simulation itself will limit the sort of measurements you can make anyway, but sort of in a way that sort of you can't notice it really. This is all of course theoretical um, and immensely difficult to carry out, hence they labelled it as a thought experiment. And as you pointed out, we don't exactly know the details of what kind of simulation it would be, or how we could find out if we are in a simulation or not, but I think it's interesting to think about. But hypothetically, if we do find out some way or another that we do live in a simulation, what would be the consequences of it? I think it depends on sort of um, the... I think it depends on everyone, everyone's individual outlook, to be honest, because I mean, I'm sure some people would find that rather disheartening, I guess, to sort of say that it's all sort of a projection of reality. Um, to sort of say it's all simulated. Some people might not care either way, because it doesn't really change your day to day, per se, I guess, because you're sort of... I mean, you'll, you'll still do what you're doing. Uh, it's still it's an interesting fact because then it sort of posed the question of um, obviously if there's a simulation there's sort of um, there must be some layer of reality there uh, at somewhere down the line just in case in case there's a simula there's a simulation of the simulation the simulations inside another simulation or if the um, the entities or civilization that are simulating this are the real world, as it were. Um, it would be interesting to sort of see what... It makes you ask the question of what um, the real um, reality actually is. Um, but obviously, it would be incredibly difficult to actually gain a sense for that from within a simulation, because you can't really... well, I mean... And not to my knowledge, you can't really observe outside a simulation. Again, there might be some clever caveat to this, but at least I have no way of uh, seeing outside that I'm aware of. Now, you dwelled on this a bit, this idea of it being disheartening for some people. Um, and actually, there's an economist out there called Robin Hansen who said, your motivation to save for retirement or to help the poor in Ethiopia might be uh, mitigated by realising that in your simulation you will never retire and there is no Ethiopia. And I think this sort of expands on what I was talking about earlier, what parts are simulated and what parts might not exist. Now, I've never been to Ethiopia, but I've obviously heard about it. As far as I know, Ethiopia might not actually exist until I actually go there and visit it if there's a simulation that revolves around my perception of the world. And if this is the case, people might rather live more for today and might unfortunately care less about others because other people would be a simulation to them. They don't exist. And I think that's quite a dark thought. Um, but as you said, we may just live life as normal. And as one person put it, have good lives and have a good time. And I think that's a good place to end our discussion. I'd like to quickly ask you, Alex, after all this, do you think we live in a simulation? Um, personally, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. <laughs> um, I don't really have any justification for that, but beyond my own sort of uh, perspective, but yeah, I personally don't think so, but again, could be wrong. Fair enough. Um, I would say I'm not sure, um, but I think it would be incredibly interesting to simulate our own universe, um, and you guys can interpret that any way you want. Um, but anyways, um, thank you so much for joining us today, Alex. Uh, my pleasure. And thank you guys for listening. I hope you found this discussion interesting, and like I said at the beginning, please take everything we say with a grain of salt. Um, this is all speculation. Uh, Alex and I are in no position whatsoever to say anything for sure about this. Um, we're not conspiracy theorists or anything, um, just interested in stuff like this, and we hope you are too. See you soon!